Uh, welcome back. We're going to finish this sphere painting now. Uh, we're going to begin by setting up the palette. Um, we're going to take some black here and uh, just a tiny bit of raw umber over here and make our main dark. You can use just black if you want, but I was taught to put a little raw ember in it to warm it a little bit so it's not such a chilly blue-black. The romber make it, makes it more of a neutral dark. So that'll be the bottom of our value scale. Um, now we're going to mix a middle value by taking a little bit of that dark and a little more of the white. And what we're aiming for is something that lands about halfway in between. I could probably speed this part of the video up. But I'll try to go fast. Uh, that's a little too light, so I add some more dark. And that looks to me to be about in the middle. And then we're going to take a little dark and mix it with some of this middle gray. And we're aiming again to be in the middle between these two. And then we're going to take, wipe off the palette knife with a paper towel. That's the great thing about palette knives versus uh, brushes. You can clean them like that. Take some white and a relatively small amount of the middle gray. You always need to add more of your light color and less of your dark color to get halfway in between. And that gives us that value. So that's a five step value scale. Um, usually, what I work with is a nine step value scale. And to create that, we just take the steps we have and we mix something in between. So that's going to go between these two. And it would be great if this was a little more organized, but I'm trying to make this, trying to do this very quickly. So that's sort of between these two. Wipe the palette knife. This is between these two. And final one between these two. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, I encourage you to take a little more time and create a value scale that's a little nicer looking and a little better organized than that. Um, now I'm going to take my palette off the screen so I can show you the reference again. So we're going to start with the background and we want to estimate what value we see first up here. Um, and notice that it is just a little bit darker than, uh, this is a little bit lighter than the background of the photograph. So let's test something here. I'm going to start with value number six. and. You see how that's just a tiny bit darker than this? And let me put it on the other side of the canvas so you can compare. And that looks like a pretty good match to me. So I'm going to stick with value number six. And I'm adding just a little bit of water to the paint so that it spreads more easily. And I'm not trying to put the paint on really thick. I'm trying to spread it thin enough so that that 
4NG ground shows through. And that's what I want you to do as well. Um, notice when there's a lot of water in the paint, it goes on a little lighter. This is exactly the same value, but it looks a little lighter with that water in it. But that water is going to evaporate rapidly, and the value is going to go back to normal. Some painters will also use painting oil to thin their paint. Um, and you can do that if you know that you're not going to repaint on top of that, but if you put oil into your painting too soon, you can run into trouble because layers that you put on top of an oily layer are more apt to crack. And so for now, we're just going to thin our paint with the solvent that we're using, which in this case is water. So that's enough paint for that background. Notice that the orange shows through, but that's what we want. And it doesn't show through evenly. There's areas where the paint's a little thicker and a little thinner. That's exactly what we're looking for. And notice also that I can gently sweep the paint over the edge of the sphere and that's probably a good thing to do because then when I paint the sphere it's going to paint's going to sit on top of that background paint. So I'm going to go up to my next highest value which is maybe seven or seven and a half um, to do the ground plane because that's significantly lighter than the wall. And again, thin the paint with water, spread it around. And because this is a flat surface, there's really no gradation of the paint. It doesn't change until I get to that cast shadow. So I can put that on pretty quickly. And even if I miss a couple little spots completely, like over here, it doesn't matter. Some people do that on purpose because it looks, looks kind of good. It looks like you don't really care that much, which is uh, sort of what we, the effect that we want. And I'm sort of settling into just using value 7 over here. It's just a tiny bit darker. And notice when I want this edge to be sharp, I'm going to move my brush along the edge like that. Again, I'm going to just let the paint pass slightly over the ball. That's fine. I can clean up that edge later. Now I want to go for my main value in the cast shadow, and that's going to be a lot darker. I'm going to start over here with, let's slide this a bit. So this is my number three value. Let's start with that. And I'm going to put that on really thin. There's a principle that most painters through history have obeyed, which is that your shadows should be thinner than your lights. And if you use an underpainting, that means that their shadows are going to be warmer than your lights, too, which um, is usually what you want. So that's really a thin layer. Um, now I'm going to go a step lighter to number four. And 
a smaller brush and I'm going to draw a ring around this shadow with that slightly lighter value. I think I might need to go up to number five. And notice that as my hand comes down this way, the ring gets fatter based on how I'm holding my brush. And when my hand goes across this way, the ring naturally gets thinner. And that's what's happening in the in the motif as well. Um, finally, I'm going to clean my brush and put a much darker dark. This is about one and a half, way down near the bottom of my value scale, uh, right under the sphere. Maybe even all the way down to one, right, right here. So this phase of the painting is called blocking in, because uh, I'm just sort of establishing my values, getting the paint down there. And while these areas are still wet, I'm now going to do all the blending that I need to do on the ground plane. There's no blending on the wall because there aren't any shadows, but on the ground plane here, I need to blend some of these edges. So what I'm going to do is clean my brush, and then I'm going to hatch across between the light color on the ground and the donut of dark shape that I put around the shadow. Like that. And then I'm going to wipe my brush off. I'm going to do the same thing between that donut of mid-tone and the cast shadow. So there's still that ring of middle dark in the middle between the shadow and the light, but the edge there is softer. And to do a final blending here, I'm going to sweep all the way around, and I'm trying to move my brush in the direction of the shadow. That's, that's about good enough. Now I'm going to work within the shadow and do some blending. Take this real dark here and blend between that and the rest of the shadow. And then I'm going to put some light in because there's some lighter value right up in here. You see that? It's, it's not true light, but it's a little bit of reflected light. It's a little lighter than the rest of that shadow. And I'm just going to spread that around right as I put it in. And I'm just going to sort of flatten this. And at this stage, the only correction I want to make is to just bring the tip of this shadow out a little more. Um, looks a little bit misshapen. And also the darker value. You can push and pull your shapes very easily if you keep the paint thin like this. If the paint's thick, you're going to have a much harder time. Okay, moving fast, but if you are at home and you're running out of time, this is a great place to stop.
because we've done all the blending we need to do right now and we are good to let the paint dry if we want. Um, it's really important not to lay paint into an area that you do not have time to blend. So this might be where a lot of people want to stop. Um, or you could spend a little while fine-tuning. See what I'm doing, just fine-tuning the edges. I might want to put a little bit of a more solid paint where the background's going to bump up against the shadow here. Kind of anticipate that and where it bumps up against this here. But now we're going to lay in the shadow and the light on the ball itself. Same procedure. Again, please take a break. Please stop if you don't have time, like another 40 minutes or so to paint the sphere. Uh, but if you're able to continue, we're going to put in a number five value on the big shadow of the sphere, again very thinly. Not working all the way up to my edges yet, I'm just sort of laying that in and then on the big light area of the sphere I'm going to go for a number 8 value again which is pretty much what I used on the floor again thinly And in the half tone between this light and the shadow, which we should probably be about halfway in between there, so that would be about number six. And notice I'm getting a pretty solid effect with very thin paint, and that's the that's the great thing about underpaintings is they allow us to paint thinly like this, the thinner you paint, the more effortless your um, blending of edges becomes. So we're going to go the number six value through here. And that's the main blocking in for the sphere. Now I'm going to go a step darker with a smaller brush. I'm going to try a number four value. And this is the darkest part of the sphere up here. And this is where I'm going to start to really try to get some clean edges. See that? Okay. Again, every time you're trying to get a clean edge, you want to pull your brush along that edge in the same direction, like that. And I'm going to transition this with a little hatching. And I'm going to pull this dark along the edge notice that the further down we go the less dark that becomes because the reflected lights bouncing in from underneath and I'm going to clean up this edge with a little bit of a slightly lighter shadow color doesn't look quite so warm. That was a 
little too bright, so I'm going to take a slightly darker gray and go right over it. And again, because the paint is so thin, those adjustments are possible. Now I want to look hard at what's happening right over here. Notice that the background is supposed to be lighter than the sphere right there, which means I need to pull this dark a little further down along this edge. And I'm also trying to get rid of that brown between the shadow and the ball. So I can tighten that up from both sides because the paint's wet on both sides. If you let your background dry, you're going to have to put some fresh paint on there if you want to, if you need to tighten the edge the way you see me doing right now. Okay, and now we're going to go onto the light side, and I'm going to go to my number. Uh, that'll be 7 again, and I'm going to put a little thicker paint along this edge so I have a little more to blend with. Maybe number 6. Seven looked a little bright. And that gives me just enough paint to wipe my brush off and go back and hatch this edge. So the same way I hatched around that donut on the shadow shape, I can hatch across this boundary line and create that kind of rough effect. Some people leave it there, but we can also sweep along the edge and soften it like that. And if it still doesn't look soft enough, wipe your brush off again, and you can repeat this as many times as you want. I hatch across the edge, and I move my brush along the edge. Um, if you've studied drawing with me, you know that it can be useful to hatch in the direction that the ball curves. And you see me doing that. And the nice thing about that is if you hatch the way the ball curves, then when you get to the outline of the ball, your brush is already moving in the direction that it needs to move to, to sharpen that edge. And remember how I painted over this edge before? Now I'm going to paint back over it the other way. And what's happening is the brush strokes that I'm making now are slightly overlapping the background brush strokes. And that's what really creates the illusion of that this is in front of the background see what that's doing and right now I'm using value number eight I'm not using white um, please don't use your brightest value for this edge because then you would have nothing left over for your highlight right so this edge is it looks brighter than it is because it has that darker background behind it but it's really not all that bright And I'm going to continue with value 8 because I want this to look just a little more solid. 
And notice I haven't put my highlight down yet. The highlight that you might think you're seeing is still the underpainting. And because that's there, I'm just going to have to barely touch my brush into the my lightest value, which is white number nine, and it's going to cover beautifully because it's on top of that underpainting. So the only thing I'm not happy with is this looks a little lumpy down here. So let's see if I can do anything about that. This got a little too dark. See how much reflected light is under there? And it's a little crooked. So I'm going to pull this contour out just a tiny bit and lighten the edge at the same time. And this is not paint by numbers. At any time, you can still try to cr make little drawing corrections if you see the need for them. And you see how I just sort of straighten that contour out? Looks a little better. Do a little more blending around here. And then to really make that, that edge pop right there, I'm going to uh, get my brush clean and this sort of goes against the rule I just taught you about overlapping paint in order to show overlapping edges, but I just want to firm up this light right here behind the edge like that really make that pop. And if you're careful, it'll still look like that's behind the edge and not in front of it. So these are not expected to be masterpieces. Um, I would not be able to sell this. I would not want to particularly hang it on the wall and look at it every day. But it's very similar to a musician playing scales. I mean, you wouldn't want to go to concert and hear even the best musician in the world play scales, but you can you know that they spent a lot of time playing scales at some point in their career, and that's why they play so well. So this is a really kind of basic assignment, um, but you could improve your skill every time you do it, and you could spend the rest of the semester painting spheres, and by the end of it, you'd probably be much better painter than you are now. The only reason we don't stick with it is because it just gets so boring and we want to paint you know more interesting subjects. I'm just gonna pull a tiny bit more reflected light in here. roughness back here. Do you see what I'm talking about right in here? So I got to remember what value I used for that. I think it was around number seven. I'm going to do that same trick where I use the background color to tighten up an edge. Notice I didn't need to do that for most of the sphere, but um, it's a good thing to know how to do.
So having added that slight lightening along this edge, I don't want that paint to stand out so much. So what I'm doing is I'm just pulling that light away from the edge to make it look a little more natural. And remember, this is a handmade artifact, and we're not trying to make it look like a photograph, right? I mean, I already had a photograph of this ball, and I don't need another, I don't need a copy of it. This is supposed to look like a painting, and paintings can have brush strokes, right? Paintings are made by hand, and you don't need to cover them all up, so don't feel like you have to. Um, but if they stand out too much and in a way that is bothering you, you can just fuzz them out and blend them away like I'm doing now. Um, it's good to know how to soften brush strokes with blending, but you don't want to rely on that all the time for everything you paint because your the movement of your hand is beautiful. That's what the what makes a painting more interesting to look at than a photograph. And it's really what makes paintings worth doing. So you don't want to just blend all those brush strokes into oblivion. Um, okay, so do the best you can with this, and uh, I can't wait to see what you come up with. Thank you very much.